together of the Kingdom of Netherlands and the Philippines and our forum partners, the Dutch Chamber of Commerce, the American Chamber of Commerce, and the Nordic Chamber of Commerce, we welcome you to our first session for our Circular Economy Forum. I say it first because our second session will be on December 5th. We'll be sharing some global best practices, Philippine best practices on circular economy, and we will be sharing more about that later. But before we officially start this program, just a, a few reminders on just some house rules. May we request everyone to have their first and last name and their organization in their display name. And to all our guests here in Zoom, you may send in your questions anytime by type, typing them in the chat box, even while the presentation's ongoing. Also, today's session is being recorded, and we may use some of it, parts of it, or all of it in our platforms and publications. And we are also live on Facebook. And we uh, also would like to remind everyone that at the end of the session, we will be having a group photo. So please keep yourself ready to turn on your camera for this. Thank you very much. So just a brief background, um, the Circular Economy Program of MBC and the Dutch Embassy uh, really aims to inspire corporate action and public-private partnerships as the Philippines transitions to a more circular economy. We started this program in August this year, and uh, the past few months, we've reached out to different stakeholders and businesses, LGUs, and waste enterprises to find possible areas for collaboration to reduce plastic waste. On the policy side, we've reached out to some of you, we've talked to some of you, we've conducted roundtable discussions, initiated consultations about the IRR of the EPR law. And this virtual forum is one of those initiatives. And we hope that this will give you a, a space where you can share your insights and challenges, also solutions, but also a place where you can ask questions and understand the evolving business environment. So before we formally begin, I'd just like to uh, recognize the presence of some of our partners. Um, the AMCHAM, of course, represented by um, Attorney Fabul and Attorney Malvar, but for our other partners from the DCCP and NordCham, um, we'd like to recognize presence of Mr. Mitchell Smolders, Executive Director of uh, the Dutch Chamber. Also, Mr. Jasper Svensson, the Executive Director of NordCham. Uh, to officially start this forum, I would like to invite Mr. Robert Vanderham, the Deputy Ambassador at the Embassy of Kingdom of Netherlands in the Philippines, for the welcome remarks. Um, Robert, the floor is yours. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, on this session on behalf of the Netherlands Embassy here in Manila. Uh, thank you all for joining this webinar on circular economy particularly on the topic of extended producer's responsibility or EPR, as we tend to call it. Um, I'd like to thank the distinguished speakers of today's sessions for their uh, session, for their contributions. Uh, Mr. Bonar Loretto, Deloitte, Mr. Bobby Batun bagal Country Manager Dow Chemicals, and Aleli, Ms. Aleli Arcilla, Managing Director, Mundelein, uh, Philippines. Uh, and of course, I'd like to thank the Mahati Business Club for hosting this event and making this possible together with the DCP and Nordchem and uh, for signing actually yesterday the, the cooperation or the partnership agreement between the Netherlands Embassy and the Mahati Business Club yesterday. Uh, so we're thankful for that and for the work you do. Um, EPR is indeed a very important and essential uh, step towards a more circular economy. Uh, and therefore, we feel this is an important topic and to kick off this uh, first uh, economic briefing session today. Um, the world faces an unprecedented challenges in waste management. Currently, 67% of global waste is uh, collected, of the waste collected, uh, is, is only 67% of the global waste collected, whereas 33% is dumped. We have a particular problem with plastics. Globally, we're still landfilling or incinerating more than 90% of the glass plastics. Uh, and I came to understand that all the plastics we ever produced uh, as a society, as a community, is still somewhere on the planet. The Philippines, especially, is troubled with unsustainable plastic uh, produce, production and consumption and has an insufficient solid waste management system uh, and infrastructure. According to the World Bank, a staggering uh, 2.7 billion uh, million tons of place rest, uh, plastic waste is generated in the Philippines each year, and an estimated 20% of it ends up in the oceans. The Philippines 
uses almost 60 billion plastic sackets each year. Uh, and indeed, most of this plastic ends up in the nature, along uh, the islands and the seas, affecting many coastal communities and leaving the uh, livelihoods of Philippines in fishing, shipping, and tourism vulnerable to the impacts of waste. Implementing circular economy concepts to me is essential in making an important and significant step in reducing uh, solid waste, particularly uh, in particular plastics. The Netherlands has made an ambitious commitment to become fully circular by 2050 and to reduce the amount of non-renewable non uh, resources by 50% in 2030. However, no single country can uh, face these uh, challenges alone, especially the global uh, value chains in which we all are connected to each other. Therefore, the Netherlands is earnest in working uh, globally uh, with partners such as the Philippines towards becoming a more global circular economy. And notably yesterday, our prime minister, Mr. Mark Rutte, uh, stated yesterday uh, during the COP uh, summit in Egypt that uh, essential um, uh, that, that cooperation with developing countries is essential essential uh, in achieving the climate goals. As a small and densely populated country, we have learned to address waste waste management already in an early stage. Um, the Netherlands has become a living lab, as we tend to say, uh, for uh, environmental solutions. Uh, where we have learned and still continue to learn about what works and what does not work. And we are eager to share, the, share these lessons uh, and also learn from the circular economy journey of other countries. Now, as we mentioned, the topic of EPR is very important. As governments, we can only play, we can play a role in setting a regulatory framework and maybe spur developments a bit by subsidy, subsidies and maybe some taxes. But we believe that the real change has to come from the private sector, looking for real uh, circular economy concepts uh, with real business models behind them, finding out what works and what doesn't. And I have seen already some inspiring examples. For instance, uh, I've seen uh, collecting waste plastics from streets, rivers and lakes and transforming them into uh, high quality roof tiles. I've seen that happening in Africa already. And I learned yesterday that uh, already in the Philippines, uh, plastic is being processed in garbage. Uh, so we applaud the Philippine government for the passing of the Extended Produce Responsibility Act 2022. Uh, this is a key legislation that will accelerate the proper management of solid waste, particularly plastics. EPR is a key concept in closing the loop in the packaging value chain to ensure responsibility and accountability on the financial cost of collecting and sorting out and recycling products after they become waste. And I think it's uh, an invitation to the private sector to come up with solid business models behind this uh, and to share your experience. I wish you a very inspiring uh, web seminar and I hope to learn a lot from you as private sector players in creating a more circular economy uh, to the benefit, of course, for all the gener generations to come. I thank you all. Thank you so much, Robert, not just for that uh, opening the forum, but also providing the context perfectly on of, about the critical problem that that we're, that we're facing and what the, the EPR law hopes to address, the critical problem on waste management, particularly plastic management. And once again, Robert, we thank the Dutch Embassy for your support and please send our regards to Ambassador Goretz. Uh, thank you and good morning. So at this point, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Bonar Laureto, uh, the Deloitte's Director of Climate and Sustainability in Asia. He joined Deloitte after serving 10 years as Executive Director of the Business for Sustainable Development and before that, Bonner spent four years as executive director of the Law of Nature Foundation. As a consultant, Bonner assists companies develop their sustainability and shared value strategies. Outside of work, Bonner enjoys biking, playing badminton, and helping poor fishing communities restore their reefs. Straight from Japan, where he is right now, Bonner, I'm turning over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rakshan, and thank you for this opportunity to be able to share. Um, our insights around the EPR. I'm just uh, 
I just need some permission to start my screen. Uh, yes, go ahead. Um. Okay. Since screen. All right. Okay, so again, thanks so much and thanks for inviting us. Uh, I have 15 minutes to go over a very extensive law. Uh, as, a, as a way of background, we've supported the Philippine Congress as part of uh, the advocacy of PARMS and BSD in the development of the law uh, to ensure that it is favorable to the, business, to the businesses who are subject to uh, the compliance requirement. So um, since then, since three years ago, uh, all the way to even today, uh, last few weeks, we have been uh, very much involved in the crafting and, and providing comments of, uh, of the IRR to ensure that all the provisions are something that makes it doable for the business to comply. So here's uh, here's just some insights uh, because there was a question posed, uh, posed to me um, as part of this invitation around the concerns uh, that many NGOs and, and other sectors are seeing the EPR law as as uh, something that's just going to encourage more, more and more use of plastics, because then you're giving the the business and, and the market the license to use this, these plastics. Uh, but on the contrary, actually, the EPR law, uh, what's so good about it is it's able to address all the major gaps uh, in what would be a good circular economy value chain. So, for a good circular economy, you have to, uh, apart from uh, the collection uh, in the MRFs and junk shops, you have to have the segregation in a manner that will be acceptable to recycling and waste processing. Uh, and, and also you have to build the market for uh, competitive uh, priced products uh, of recycled products for a circular economy to happen. But what's happening right now without EPR law is we have a lot of challenges. Number one, uh, very difficult to recycle packaging are there, uh, flexibles with high PET content, for example. Uh, it's difficult to, to segregate at the collection level because there's no label. Um, and one of the provisions of EPR actually addresses the labeling. Uh, the, local, uh, the consumers have very little motivation to do the segregation. Uh, in the collection, there's the LGs don't have, they have the facilities, they are mandated by law to recover, but they can only fund the recovery of mixed waste. They cannot uh, have a value adding process to segregate because that's very expensive. And therefore recyclers spend uh, for their resources to be able to do the segregation so they will have a feedback. And that makes the product more expensive and less competitive in the market, which uh, it ma makes it very problematic in terms of sustainability of feedstock and the sustainability of their market as a recycling uh, business. And therefore, very few are encouraged to invest in recycling. And that sort of continues a loop why uh, a lot of all of a lot of these weeds are being dumped just in dump sites and when it leaks into the environment. What the EPR provides, uh, the good thing about EPR is, apart from the labeling provision, um, there is uh, the EPR provides for a private sector finance mechanism, uh, fin uh, bridging the gap of finance in LGU by creating that uh, added layer of segregation so that you can recover the wastes that will become uh, good and acceptable feedstock at the recycling level. And with the imputed finance of the private sector, what will happen is it will make the products more less expensive, more competitive, and it will drive more demand for recycled products. And all of this will actually uh, remove the gaps of our circular economy uh, that is enabled by the provisions of the EPR law. And, and so, um, uh, as contrary to many objections to the EPR law, EPR law provides very, very good enabling mechanism for circular economy. Uh, I have 15 minutes to cover an extensive set of provisions. I've prepared this, this single uh, deck, a single slide that shows the most important salient features of the EPR law. Of course, who needs to comply? Of course, the, uh, all large enterprises that generate plastic packaging waste are mandated to comply. Uh, the, the responsibility uh, is based on the brand ownership. So if you own a brand and you bring, bring this, um, 
particular product with your brand into the market, you own that uh, packaging. And therefore, regardless of the supplier of that packaging, you own that. If you have the brand name there, you own that packaging and that's going to be part of your plastic footprint. Um, MSMEs are not covered, but are encouraged. Um, for those smaller, uh, for those medium-sized uh, organizations, if they have a brand that collectively uh, adds up in terms of asset value to a large, beyond um, the definition of medium-sized company, uh, then they also need to be um, in incorporated. So for example, you have franchises, franchises that, I, that individually are, are just medium, but collectively as a brand will constitute a large company, then that they will be included as part of the obliged companies. Which wastes are covered? Uh, all types of packaging wastes. Uh, please note that tarpaulins and signages, uh, promotional items are also included. Uh, plastic bags that are branded uh, will have to be considered as part of the footprint of a company. Ridges, hard plastics, flexibles, those are that are soft plastics used in, in um, packaging as well. Um, very important that February, by February 2023, uh, the companies, obliged companies, must be able to submit your EPR plan, EPR program. Uh, and that will have to be submitted to the NEC. And there's a back and forth uh, uh, process to ensure that they are in compliance with the specifications. And if they are already in, in compliance, then it will be accepted. Yeah, uh, And then the obliged company will have one, a year to recover uh, an intended amount of waste, um, which is in the recovery targets. Um, and, and by 2024, uh, June 2024, then, um, sorry, uh, July 2024, uh, the uh, EPR compliance audit report will have to be submitted by the obliged company. Um, what is expected of the obliged company? First, of course, you have to account for your waste footprint. Uh, the standards for waste footprint will be developed by government in due time, but the IRR uh, as of today uh, stipulates that you have to, to uh, private sector, whether obliged company, collective or PR, EPR, uh, PRO will have to develop their own standard. Um, they must also, as part of uh, the most important mandate, they must also demonstrate that they're able to recover a percentage of that footprint based on a schedule of uh, recovery targets. So the recovery targets um, would be 20% for the first year, that's uh, ending uh, 2020, 2023, December. Uh, and then for, that doubles to 40% by 2024 and 10% incremental increase uh, year on year as you achieve 80% by uh, 2028 and onwards. Um, and that uh, diversion, both the footprint and the diversion needs to be audited by a third party as provided for by the law. Um, and and um, part of the law is actually a, a, a requirement for obliged companies to create a roadmap to be able to have labeling uh, for their products, which will facilitate the recovery, use, recycling, and proper disposal of packaging waste. Um, uh, in terms of compliance, uh, what can be the option for obliged companies? So the law provides three options. Either you um, provide, in the, you uh, comply with the requirements as an individual. Uh, that means you'll have to disclose your own uh, company's data to DNR, to NEC. And with that company data, you'll have to demonstrate that you're able to meet the, uh, the recovery target as provided by law. Um, collective uh, is also provided for where co collectively you can pull together your total footprint and uh, you're able to set up your own collective recovery and diversion value chain um, so that all of you will be able to comply. Um, the other uh, option is PRO and our understanding of PRO is where there is actually a, a trading an exchange, a trading platform for uh, uh, waste credits and there will be multiple stakeholders as part of that PRO where you have waste diversion, obliged companies, certifying bodies, among other key uh, stakeholders that will operationalize that PRO. Um, later, I'll share a bit of uh, some um, pros and cons on uh, as far that can be useful for decision-making among the obliged companies who are in the room. Um, so, 
um, I, I, I suppose we will have some more time to discuss more of the provisions, but this is really just uh, the most important things that all obliged companies must know at this point. Um, I'm sure the other speakers, like Attorney Mimi, Attorney uh, Joe Fab, will be able to share a little bit more in terms of details. Um, what I what I foresee as one uh, one of the biggest challenges that obliged companies will have to get through is around how to set up your diversion, how to meet your recovery targets. Uh, and I see in the market that there are three approaches. Um, the first approach is a company will build its own value chain. Uh, with this, you will necessarily have to partner with LGUs uh, directly, uh, build your own waste recovery value chain working with local stakeholders, uh, connect with recyclers or waste treaters, waste processing organizations, um, and build uh, that throughput of recovery of, pro uh, of uh, materials and also the market of rec recycled products and engage with an audit partner uh, provider. Um, in that system, you have full control over that system. Uh, uh, how What goes in and out of that system, you have full control. Um, the other approach that I see in the market is you actually partner with an existing uh, waste diversion and recovery organization. These are the uh, uh, waste uh, plastic bank, uh, waste plastic flamingo, uh, those uh, different organizations that provide services to recover on behalf of the company. So what happens there is you have a partnership, you pay the fee, uh, the, the organization diverts and recovers and diverts for you, uh, you pay the, the cost of diversion plus their management fee, and then allow you to, uh, uh, you allow them to recover and, and recover uh, the needed uh, requirement for your compliance requirement. Um, the other option is to join a PRO and uh, or PRO or collective. Uh, usually the collective, uh, as a collective, all the, all the members of that collective will have to cover the cost of establishing the waste value chain. Collectively, you will uh, build that, uh, but also be able to really pay for the cost of recovery, uh, cost of running that PRO or the collective. So there's some, some management costs that will be involved. Uh, in terms of advantages and disadvantages, I see that um, from, from an advantage point of view of building your own, you have more control, you have more learning opportunity. Uh, you can scale up, you can uh, engage with more LGUs as you learn, you can be very efficient in your process. However, that will require some, uh, a little bit of upfront cost um, in, as, as, as you pursue that option. Um, partnering with the other, with organizations as a second option might uh, have lower cost as an advantage, but with a tough competition out there in terms of waste diversion credits, because eventually, suddenly everyone will have to comply with the law. There's a risk that the, the partner may not be able to deliver what they promised to you uh, because of a, a tough competition on the ground in terms of partnership with local governments that already might have allocated their waste with other, other entities. So that's gonna be uh, a risk that you'll have to manage as you think about your option. Um, which is also the same uh, if you just rely on a PRO or a collective, because uh, sometimes, uh, you know, collectively it's it's incredibly challenging to get things to happen on the ground because there's, you know, there's a lot of agreements that needs to happen. And now uh, since things are on a rush, uh, there's, there's one year to actually de demonstrate the version. Uh, it could really be challenging as well. Um, and, and so my, my recommendation is really to start with building your own value chain, perhaps join a collective and PRO, but secure your own uh, recovery on the ground, create your partnership to ensure that you have waste uh, value chain to meet uh, the, the, uh, that, they, that you can maintain and grow and be maybe collect, uh, join a collective or a PRO to take advantage of the standards, take advantage of the collective uh, platform that they have in terms of recording all of the waste diversion. And I believe um, having a, a right mindset, high, having the right information in terms of what happens and what goes on on the ground is key to uh, being able to meet your recovery and diversion target. Um, I hope this uh, helps the audience today. Thank you. Bona, you're, you're perfectly on time. Uh, thank you so much for, for that. Uh, uh, concise the uh, the key features uh, featuring the key features of the the law. We're gonna try to unpack it more uh, during our discussion. 
and that's where we encourage everyone to participate. We actually received already a few questions. We'll get to them in a while, but um, we'll just take a little break to hear from you, uh, to hear from the guests um, via Paul. So before uh, we begin the panel discussion, I introduce our panelists. We will send out three poll questions on your screen. Now, this one, uh, this is the, the, the calendar uh, schedule uh, shared by Bonner earlier um, with regards to large companies um, being aware of the schedule um, and uh, meeting the compliance of that law. Uh, with the schedule, we want to ask you three questions and please scroll down to view questions two and three. So please take your time and uh, um, I just go through the questions. We're gonna ask you here, we're asking you here, how confident are you in your, your company's knowledge, your knowledge um, uh, about the EPR Act as of this point? Also, we'd like to know um, what are some initiatives that you're doing EPR related in your company? Um, that number two question is um, multiple choice. Um, the third question is with the deadline for establishing the phase in EPR programs uh, already set in February next year, 2023, where is your company in its preparation? So we're really uh, just curious on where you are right now um, and also understanding your concerns or um, you know what initiatives, how prepared are you? Okay, so right, I'll give you about uh, 10 more seconds for that. Um, before we end the poll. In the meantime, I um, would like to remind everyone uh, later on before, uh, before we end the for forum, we'll be having a, a photo opportunity. So please uh, stay uh, for that. Uh, okay, and uh, we're closing it in um, three seconds. Okay, uh, people are still answering. Thank you for, for these. Very interesting so far. Okay. Um, all right, so let's end the poll. Um, all right, thank you so much. Um, on the first question, how confident are our guests, our uh, participants in their knowledge about the EPR Act? It's somewhat in the middle, all right? I think 38%, majority 38% are not so, this is an average understanding about uh, the EPR law. Um, also, number two, what are some initiatives that they're doing? We see majority of them, 38%, mostly on waste diversion, um, followed by um, assisting the informal waste sector, working with informal waste sector. Um, and this is actually an a, 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 a interesting part, um, Bonar, because I'd like to get your thoughts. You know, you work with, Deloitte works with uh, different companies, and uh, is this the same trend that you're seeing? Um, uh, right now, there's more um, partnerships with LGUs. I suppose that's good. Um, and then finally, on the third question, um, the deadline for the EPR uh, phase in, um, where are they in their preparation? Um, so we do have a lot of not applicable, I think, because some of them are um, either in the services or partners of producers, but also part of the stakeholders. Um, but we also have, they're finalizing their EPR program, which is good. And also they're waiting for the IRR. Um, but I just like very quickly asked Boner about the number two question, um, which is going back, um, you know, based on some of uh, the companies that you work with, um, is this the same trend that you're seeing? Uh, the EPR initiatives in the Philippines really mostly on waste diversion um, and working with informal sector? Uh, yes, uh, part of the, the work I've done in the past, even before joining Deloitte, was to really work on the ground with LGUs, with uh, informal waste sector. Uh, and I was involved also in a World Bank project to try and understand the circumstances of informal waste sector. And so necessarily, uh, one of the most efficient way of collecting the waste is to already work with those that are already involved in waste management on the ground. So we've, uh, for example, street sweepers uh, in, and uh, those who recover recyclables. Uh, that's already their chosen profession. And when we asked them, would you want to work in a quick service restaurant? They said, no, this is the, the preferred work that we want to do. And because of that, then it's more strategic to engage with them and add value to their livelihood uh, by asking them to recover beyond just the recyclables 
recover both the flexibles and a certain qual quality uh, and cleanliness uh, so that they can be acceptable to the rec uh, recyclers. And with that, there's additional income for them. Uh, and what we're I'm trying personally uh, trying to push for in terms of standards, uh, hopefully to be incorporated in the IRR is really the social safeguards and social equitability uh, standards for the informal waste sector. Because there's a good chance that uh, these mo very important stakeholders in the circular economy can get excluded in terms of the value that will be generated from uh, the whole waste value chain. Uh, they are the most critical stakeholder because they're the ones manually collecting this waste and they're exposed out there. And probably the big big ones who will be working with them might might be making more money than them. So this is this is uh, at the very minimum they have to have the minimum conditions to to sustain a decent life, a decent job. Uh, and, and these are already well provided in our policies in DOLE, for example, or green job standards uh, in the Climate Change Commission. Hopefully those standards will be adopted uh, as part of the standards for waste recovery uh, in the implementation of um, the EPR law. Thanks for raising that, Bonar. We really had we got an interesting feedback from one of our member companies about the human rights and the social aspect of fulfilling, particularly also working with the informal waste sector. And I'll get back to that. Um, but this part we'll, go, we'll get on. We have a, a number of questions already lined up. Um, but uh, this session um, is, is really, we want it more of a conversation and we want um, you know our attendees to be part of it. We want you to be part of it. So please feel free to type in your questions. And then we will be inviting you to ask your questions personally or share your thoughts. Um, but of course I can read them out loud as well, but please do keep them uh, clear and concise. So let's get on with it. Um, Bonar in our panel discussion will be joined by attorney Joseph Fabul and attorney Mimi Malvar, who both are the co-chairs of the American Chamber of Sustainability Committee. Attorney Joseph Fabul is the International Country Manager for Corporate and Government Affairs of Mondelez International Philippines, and he has an extensive experience working with multinational companies. And Attorney Mimi Malvar is the Government Relations Director and Assistant General Counsel of Procter & Gamble. She also advocates for women empowerment, equality, and inclusivity, especially in the workplace. She joins us today from Dubai, which I believe it's about 5.30 in the morning there. So good morning, uh, Attorney Joseph and Attorney Mimi. Thanks, Roxanne. Good morning. Good morning to everyone. Hi, Roxanne. Good morning to everyone. All right, thank you for joining us. I'm going to just jump straight to um, a question from our guests. And I'd like to invite, if you'd like to ask his question personally, Mr. David Bruce, um, are you there? Okay, I'm, I'm not sure if, if David uh, can speak right now, but I'll just read his question. Uh, David Bruce is the Managing Director of Perfetti Van Mel. Is there clarity already on the cost uh, per rate, uh, per kilogram or per ton of offsetting the plastic Footprint. You touched a little bit about this a while ago, um, Bonner. Um, uh, maybe you can expand that this is a time to do. So the question is about the pricing? Yeah, the, yes. Oh, okay. So the pricing uh, basically will be set based on the cost of recovery. And the cost of recovery varies largely based on several factors. One, uh, of course, the geographic distribution, the more transport cost you pay. And, and so and so on. Uh, the other one would be the availability of certain technologies uh, within that location. Uh, and the technology will also dictate how expensive that is if you're talking about co-processing or waste. So I don't think there needs to be, a, uh, there has to be a standardized way of, um, or pricing the, the credit. Uh, uh, I think it needs to be based on your type of packaging that you put out to the market, whatever that is. The cost of recovering that is something that you should internalize as part of your PNL. All right, um, thanks. And um, I'm just gonna go straight to um, another question from the same company, but this time from Leanne Ledesma. Just checking, Leanne, um, are, uh, can you, uh, are you free to ask your question? Yes, yeah, sure. Can, can you, I can't see myself, but. So my question was regarding, um, you know, the several options or the three options that you presented earlier on how to, for compliance. So I was just wondering, is there a strict um, 
mandate that you are only allowed to choose one route or are companies actually able to maybe combine two routes? I think it's best to get um, Attorney Joseph or to Mimi, Mimi to respond to that, but there's no specification on that. Mm -hmm. Uh, attorney, maybe Joseph, yeah, or maybe I'll answer that question. I think, uh, thanks for that question, Leanne. The beauty, I think, of the EPR law as it passed um, Congress and, and as they're discussing the IRR now is that it affords the obliged enterprises a host, a menu of programs that you can choose from in order to comply with the waste diversion targets that start in 2023. Now, the full IRR is not out yet. Um, and I think what's important for the obliged enterprises is to keep those options open um, and, and viable for all of us to, to be able to make decisions based on uh, decisions based on what works for our companies based on our plastic footprint, based on our partnerships also, what partnerships that we can have with the um, multiple stakeholders that we can um, try to engage in the country. Um, there's some uh, discussions right now in the IRR, if, I, if I'm being very candid, on kind of having specific targets for each program. But this mm -hmm. is something that I think industry is trying to input on, make recommendations on so that we can continue to enjoy you know, and be able to choose from a big menu of EPR programs that we can um, do versus being tied to a specific program for the rest of your compliance period. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Attorney Fabul, do you have anything to add? No, I, I think I'll just add to what Mimi said. No? Um, it depends on the company, really. Um, Various um, obliged companies will have different types of packaging material, uh, rigid, flexible, will have different volumes. And, um, you know, some of us have already been working with various waste diverters who are now positioning themselves as um, PROs or producers' responsibility organization. And you already have a certain level of trust and confidence in the service that they provide. I think the real issue here is that if you fail to comply, if you fail to register, comply, you underdeclare, or you, there's a there's a punitive or a penalty for the obliged company. So it's very important not only to establish a good relationship with the with the people you're working with towards compliance, but also have redundancies. So just be sure that you also have a backup plan, a plan B, um, in case things don't work out um, with with the um, waste diverters or PROs that you're working with. And and just to answer um, David's question earlier as well, um, just to add yeah. to what Bonner was saying also, there's no, I mean, it will depend on the contract. The cost will depend on the contractual agreement with the waste diverter or PRO. Um, maybe mm -hmm. just to share, I've been approached by five different organizations already offering PRO services and what the um, what these uh, PROs are asking for is the weight and volume of plastic that I have, so that they can submit a quote per kilo or per ton. So it becomes it it comes down to your negotiation with the PRO or waste diverter that you're working with. But um, all the factors that Bonner mentioned come into play. But again, it's a business, so many of these um, organizations um, also have you know a certain they have different margins that they they put in. Attorney, you mentioned a while ago, um, you know, if um, you make mistakes or you underreport, um, you know, there's consequences for that. Um, but uh, in other countries, I understand that there are third party auditors. Um, is that uh, how does that how do you anticipate that being? Is that something that right now is already being um, prepared for in the Philippine market while we're still you know, starting as we're starting the EPR implementation? Yes, yes, Roxanne. It's actually part of the uh, law and the IRR. So an independent third-party auditor is required to certify the veracity of your report. And uh, in fact, I know certain companies who are even hiring an auditor for pre-assurance work um, okay. because it's a new law. It's a new requirement. Um, companies like Deloitte um, and, and others, um, aud other auditing firms are even offering pre-assurance work to help um, organizations comply with the EPR requirement. So 
um, the, as you mentioned, Roxanne, the, the ex okay. external third party auditor is actually an essential um, requirement. The certification from the third party auditor is an essential requirement to our EPR report. Okay, and um, just uh, continuing on the discussion a while ago about um, you know companies already uh, thinking of either doing it you know um, uh, strengthening their 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 value chain or doing it collectively or via PRO. Um, I'd like to get um, your uh, maybe what you're doing already in the FMCG. Is there any collective discussions going on with the players in the FMCG industry or the sector about you know some game plan that um, if there's a collective game plan that you're thinking of doing? Or right now, the sense is it's more of a solo approach or a one-by-one -one approach. Um, Attorney Mimi? Maybe I'll take that. We have been working very closely with the Philippine Alliance of Recycling for Recycling and Material Sustainability. It's called FARMS. We've done the, we, you know, even before ahead of the implementation of the EPR law, I think there was a just a general sense among many players across the waste management value chain, including consumer goods companies that you know, this is an important um, project. This is an important topic to ally together and to band ourselves together and to try to find real solutions, very scalable solutions, so we can all address, you know, this pesky problem of plastic um, packaging. Um, so uh, several years ago, farms um, and farms was. Uh, uh, formed and then the consumer goods, many consumer goods companies um, joined farms in order to uh, collectively look at this problem and collectively uh, find solutions that we can work together and cooperate with each other on um, so that we can address the problem very um, proactively already. So um, right now, there are discussions to pilot, you know, pilot a sustainable kind of sustainable infrastructure and a sustainable system so that we can all meet our waste diversion targets. This is something that's already under discussion. Um, so many in the consumer goods industries, I think it, it also varies, you know, depends. There are some who are still who are members of farms who are very actively in discussions with farms, but also doing their own thing already. But many players, I would say, have joined farms in order to, you know, reach scale, you know, and then also very, uh, very collaborate very well, collaborate very well on this issue and also approach this as a multi-stakeholder problem so we can engage the right people um, on the ground to achieve and achieve our waste diversion targets. All right. Thank you, Attorney Mimi. Um, I, I'll, I'd like to invite um, Ms. Angela Aquino. She's from the Asian Institute of Management. She has a really good question. I, um, I think this is also in the minds, very simple question, but it's in the minds of you know, a lot of people. Um, but um, Angela, are, are you there? Hello, good morning. Apologies good morning. for the off cam. Um, so in the Philippines, we have a lot of uh, imported products. So we buy from Landers, from SNR, not to mention we also buy products from Shopee and Lazada, wherein a lot of people just buy from um, international producers and sell it here in the Philippines. So how do we plan to implement EPR law on imports or maybe imported product uh, distributors here in the Philippines? Maybe uh, Boner. You can answer that question. Okay, so certainly the EPR law is not perfect at this point. There are gaps in the system. Uh, so unless you are a large, com large company and you have assets, you have inventory that exceeds the medium, uh, then you will, um, if you exceed the medium, then you will be included as part of the obliged companies. However, unfortunately, even if you have import you import a lot of goods and your uh, your assets is below uh, the definition of what is a medium, then you're not going to be part of the obliged companies. So that's an, I guess, uh, that's an important uh, gap in the policy. Uh, I suppose uh, the the intent, the wisdom of the of the direction of the law as of now is to start with the largest contributor. And then the law also provides that in the next five years, there will be a review 
after five years, there will be a review process of the law, which is already provided in the in the RA. Um, and that review process will, I think, address those gaps where uh, eventually it needs to be brought down to those smaller players who are importing goods. But um, just to clarify, all uh, importers meeting the large definition beyond the medium size definition uh, are already part of the obliged. And whatever brand that they bring, uh, those brands that are uh, in on the packaging, on the products, will have uh, to account for those and will be the owner of that footprint. Thanks, Boner. Leanne, do you have a follow-up question on that? Okay, so I'll assume none. Um, I'll just uh, jump to a, uh, an interesting Maybe statement. Yes, Maybe Patrick. I can also provide a little perspective. I think that's an, it's important to highlight that this, is, this indeed seems to be a gap. But um, the IRR as it's being implemented now tries to address this gap by putting together a provision that will um, hopefully make the Bureau of Customs an interagency kind of collaborative effort with the Bureau of Customs, the DTI, to see what these gaps are and to also try to address, you know, how we can um, capture um, obliged enterprises uh, that fully import. So, you know, um, how, how do you assess that and how do you um, make them comply? Because under the strict terms of just the law, then th these uh, obliged, they can be considered obliged em enterprises, even if they're just importers, if they import a certain number of um, products, consumer goods products that have plastic packaging in the market. My hope is that this gets addressed, you know, this task or this interagency kind of partnership and collaboration can work together so that this uh, this um, particular uh, gap can be plugged and we can all see a lot, many obliged enterprises stepping up and really complying with the, with the law. Thank you, Attorney Mimi. Attorney Joseph, do you have anything to add there? Well, um, yes, maybe Roxanne, a lot of our products um, are actually imported. Um, chocolates and, and biscuits are mostly imported from other regions. And since we fall under uh, the large enterprise classification, we fully intend to declare and comply with the EPR law. So, um, you know, even if you're an importer, um, you know, we still um, comply. I think maybe um, you know, maybe it's the small importers that, that don't reach the threshold that we really need to look out for. Thank you, Attorney Joseph. Um, Bonar, may I invite you for the interest of our viewers in Facebook? I know you already answered um, Carla, Ms. Carla Capistrano's question, but maybe you can um, share it, um, you know, your, your answer in the chat box. Um, Carla asked about um, would company company's plastic footprint needed to be audited upon their registration by February 2023? Um, some may find that they need to adjust this by 2024 uh, reporting or compliance. Maybe you just share so um, you know okay. for, for for viewers in Facebook. Thank you. So as mentioned by Attorney Mimi, the IRR has yet to be released. So until such time, we won't have a definitive answer to that. Because but based on the uh, the latest draft that we saw. Uh, there is a provision, a leeway that uh, the the obliged company don't necessarily have to have their footprint uh, and, and diversion audited uh, on the first year. Uh, they allow for self declaration. Of course, nothing prevents you from going through the external assurance as a sort of a, a practice, uh, you know, because there's a lot of things that needs to be looked at in terms of the footprint accounting and the diversion. Uh, but it's not mandatory in the first year. Second year, yes, this is going to be mandatory. What, what are on the topic of measuring and reporting? I'd like to invite back Leanne uh, Ledesma of Perfect Ivan Mel to ask her uh, related question. Leanne? Yeah, so, so since it's not required for us to, to actually um, involve a third-party auditor, how then will companies, you know, there may be different ways of how we actually measure our our waste, right? So is there a standard that's provided by the IRR for us to be able to determine if we're actually declaring the right amount or under declaring it? Thanks so much for asking that question. You just hit a, a chord that very much excites. 
<laughs> attorney Joseph, Attorney Mimi knows that. Um, one of the very important aspects of the EPR is really the standards for accounting both the footprint and the recovery on the ground. Uh, lest we experience double counting, there are gaps in the accounting if there are various standards out there that is adopted by collective PROs and individual of large companies. So right now, the provision in the IRR, again, draft IRR, is that uh, government will have to develop its standard. But while government is doing that, private sector is being asked to develop their own standard. So right now, uh, Attorney Mimi has mentioned that PARMS has been working on EPR. PARMS has its own standard uh, for all of these. Uh, it's being pilot tested. So uh, I'm biased towards recommending that uh, if you are looking for a standard, please uh, get in touch with Attorney Mimi or Attorney Joseph. Uh, they're both part of the Legis Committee. Uh, Attorney Mimi is the head of Legis Committee of PARMS. They can share with you the standards that uh, has been developed already and is being pilot tested. I, it, it's it's very important. That's a very very important point, and we hope that more and more companies would would adhere to a common standard. And what we have right now is farms, uh, and and hopefully um, we get to also through MBC inform more and more companies that there is such a standard uh, out there. Thank you, Bonner. Um, uh, Miss Evelyn Dofredo. Uh, of uh, Seventh SMC, are you there to ask your question? Hello, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, actually, this is related to the question about the uh, independent auditor, which is uh, actually a requirement of the EPR. So uh, I understand that uh, the RA nine zero zero three is the source of uh, this EPR, for which we have these uh, two. Uh, points for uh, we have the segregation and the reduction. So now we are tackling this uh, reduction by uh, PPR. So uh, right now, I think uh, for industries or uh, companies, uh, it is uh, there is no standard yet uh, being uh, established because uh, it's still on the process of uh, drafting the IRR for which there is this uh, part that uh, the internal audit should be uh, based on uh, standards like that. So. Uh, I, if, uh, if a company is doing establishing this uh, EPR now, uh, how can this uh, company uh, select auditors? That's just my uh, uh, weird uh, opinion or uh, right now. So how company select an independent auditors uh, in the absence of a standard or a competence no? or qualification? So how's that? Maybe let's ask um, attorney Joseph and attorney Mimi representing their companies. Um, well, for the independent third party certification, basically um, our company will use the same auditor we use for our financial reporting to do our non-financial reporting so that at least we're just dealing with one auditing firm. Um, they will certify um, all documents for, for the company. Um, but it is a challenge. Um, talking to them right now, since there are there is no standard um, and you know there are several levels of EPR because even the reduction of the plastic um, that we're putting out into the market and not necessarily recovery and, and recycling, but just the reduction of the plastic packaging footprint we, we put out, uh, we don't put out, uh, is credited to us. So even things like that, I mean, how, how do you implement all of it without the standard? And um, we're really looking forward to working with the DNR and the DTI Bureau of Product Standards into you know fast tracking this so that all companies who are covered by the law will be guided accordingly. Thank you, uh, Attorney Nini. Do you have anything to add? Agree with what Joe said. I think for big companies, we tend to rely on existing partnerships with or existing strategic partnerships. You no, know, with uh, auditing firms who do our financial um, reporting. But my hope really is that once these standards are set up and, and according to the la latest draft of the IRR, you know, these standards will be put in place um, on, on how to qualify independent third party auditors and what standards they need to observe in order to do their job, you know, consistently across clients and, and in accordance with um, how the law 
should be um, observed. Once these standards are met, hopefully there are a lot of other players that can be tapped as well for, for many, many of the obliged enterprises that will have to go through this auditing process. Thank you, Attorney Mimi. Actually, uh, Ms. Evelyn uh, made a comment a while ago about you know, keeping your business model, your products um, in, in a way that you cut generation of waste right from the source, um, for instance, green purchasing. And that's related to um, my next question, um, again, to Attorney Mimi and Attorney Joseph. Um, how do you think the new EPR law will impact companies in your industry in terms of the UC potential trade-offs? between cost efficiency and sustainability. Um, in short, are there uh, actually uh, enough of this green um, alternatives? How will this impact maybe costing? Go ahead, Mimi. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to adjust. I think Roxanne, um, EPR, it's going to be, it's going to have to really go through big birthing pains, at least in the beginning. Um, we do see, you know, some, you know, there's a significant cost implications, I think, for an obliged enterprises as well that will have to comply with quite ambitious waste diversion targets, especially at the beginning, and then laddering up. So if you recall, Bonar slide, it's 20% on the first year and then 40% on the second year. So these are very ambitious um, waste diversion targets. Um, definitely will have cost implications. Definitely, you know, right now, at least sustainable options for for packaging are, are quite costly. But my hope is that, you know, as this law um, becomes implemented and as more and more stakeholders um, really try to get organized and collaborate on multiple efforts, including plastic packaging innovation, including, you know, end of life, um, end of life options for obliged enterprises, that hopefully there is no trade-off and that there will we will be able to continue of, um, giving uh, products, um, very good consumer goods products to our consumers at price points that they, they can, you know, that, that it can pay, but at the same time with sustainable, you know, with sustainability, uh -huh. sustainable plastic packaging options. That's really tough. At the beginning, it's going to be hard, but hopefully, you know, we get a we get the momentum going and we get a lot of the collaborations in place in, at least um, in the country. Yeah. Thank you, Attorney Mimi. Um, Attorney Bonner, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask you a question related to your presentation earlier. Um, so during the final IRR reading this week, it was mentioned that MSMEs are not yet required to submit an, an EPR program, but they are encouraged to do so. Um, can you share like maybe what are the, the opportunities or maybe spaces from where MSMEs who want to do this, you know, voluntarily um, the ear earlier on, um, what are their opportunities um, maybe to join a collective or, or, or PRO um, or any other strategy like that that's open for them? Yeah, so, so it's not a far-fetched idea when during the fifth year review where MSME might already be included. So, so my recommendation to SMEs would be to start looking into their option even within this next five years. Uh, of course, there's cost consideration for complying, for building your own waste diversion. Uh, but what they can do in terms of opportunities to see whether they can already start shifting towards more recyclable packaging. Because the more recyclable your packaging is, the lesser is the cost of recovery. And that process takes a bit of time working with your packaging suppliers. So for example, if you have a packaging that already has very high content of PET that's difficult to recycle, you wanna try to work with your suppliers to see whether you can shift that to more PPP, higher PPP content so that uh, you're sort of gearing up uh, if and when um, you are going to be required in the uh, after five years, then you're already more or less um, ready uh, in terms of the types of materials you put out there, uh, make it more affordable. And and I guess that's that's something that also uh, partly addresses the earlier question around how to 
uh, balance the trade-off uh, in terms of sustainability versus price. Um, eventually, um, you know, uh, this is an externality that needs to be internalized in the PNL. Uh, and the EPR is a very good step towards that, but there is a way to minimize the cost and the the, the cost to reduce the uh, the the approach to redu red reduction of cost in the recovery starts with uh, producing the right materials, the right packaging. Because if you have high PP, high PE content, uh, that can could very well go into, for example, waste to fuel or waste to asphalt, which is very uh, value adding because you reduce the use of bitumen to create your asphalt roads if you have high PP, high PE content. And, yeah. and that value creation is going to drive recovery of this waste at a much lower rate, even maybe make this uh, waste sellable already, right? So that will reduce the cost of compliance for the obliged companies, hopefully uh, meeting both objectives of sustainability and cost competitiveness. Bonner, I love what you just said. This is an externality that needs to be internalized in the PNL. So thank you for that. But we're we're about to wrap up our um, discussion. But before that, this is something that really we should highlight for as well. And like to invite Attorney Mimi and Attorney Joseph. Maybe maybe you can share um, some of the things that you're doing with LGUs, um, or maybe with other uh, you know um, uh, other stakeholders that um, you know, even before the EPR law, you're already um, working um, on, on addressing waste, man waste management or plastic waste, but maybe you can share for inspiration what you're doing right now with, with the LGUs and other parties. Um, again, maybe aligned, that could be aligned with the EPR implementation. Okay, um, let me go take this first, um, uh, Mimi. So yes, um, both our companies have been uh, working with various organizations and local governments even prior to the passage of the EPR law. I think packaging sustainability is really part of uh, the long-term strategy of, of, bo of both our organizations. And um, for Mondelez, uh, you know, we have this simple um, packaging sustainability strategy, which is to use less packaging, better packaging, and to improve systems. So from my level, from the market level, I really can't uh, fix less packaging or better packaging because that's from an R&D level, but I can improve the systems here in the Philippines by investing in waste diversion value chains, partnering with organizations and LGUs, and at the same time, increasing the level of awareness of our consumers. So. Um, maybe the most recent partnership uh, Mondelez has is we donated recently a re um, Green Ants Recycling Hub in Paranaque City in order to recover and recycle flexible plastic material and turn these into eco bricks. We also work with different organizations like uh, Plastic Credit Exchange, Plastic Flamingo, um, Basic Environmental Systems and Technology for Trash to Cashback, um, you know, and, um, and many others. I'm sorry. If I, I can't yeah. mention the others, but really what we have now is a, you know, the systems we have in place for waste diversion um, have still a, have a lot of room for improvement. And it's only if, um, you know, large FMCGs will invest and create a market for this, these types of businesses to, to invest in themselves, then I think that's the only way that you can improve these systems. And um, the same for LGUs because um, you know they actually they're actually the frontliners for waste uh, diversion, and so by partnering with them, sometimes incentivizing the retrieval programs, then then you're strengthening their capabilities. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, I think it's it's uh, you know an important initiative for for companies like ours. Thank you, Attorney Mini. So for PNG Roxanne, we have what we call Ambition Twenty Thirty, which. This specific um, to plastic packaging, we really want to reduce um, our uh, reduce. I mean, have 100% of our plastic packaging reusable and recyclable by 2030, and that is a very ambitious target, especially in developing markets like the Philippines, where you really have a sachet economy, right? But we are very slow, very. Um, definitively um, achieving that and having a glide path towards uh, achieving that goal by 2030. In the Philippines in particular, you know, 
a lot of our, we have done away with, let's say, plastic overwrap on some of our safeguard multipacks, and we have replaced them with recyclable um, carton. Our herbal essences um, products are the, they're the shampoo bottles, 25% uh, uh, are, are already um, PCR or post-consumer uh, resin. And then in the Philippines, we do have partnerships with uh, several organizations like World Vision to retrieve um, sachet waste and put them to um, use through plastic chairs. So chairs um, that we donate back to schools. We have collected over 3.2 million um, sachets already and over 870,000 um, rigid um, bottles. And then we have converted them into um, good uses. Um, what we are really looking forward to is really, you know, making mo making progress towards our commitments in a very real way, especially with the EPR law that just uh, that was just passed. Um, as I said a while ago, very ambitious waste diversion targets by 20%. So we really want to improve uh, and, and and have a lot more partnerships, I, I think, with many other organizations that are players in this field so that we can achieve those commitments as well by 2023. Thank you so much, Attorney Mimi. Attorney Joseph, thank you again so much. Of course, Bonar, thank you. Bonar um, and, and Attorney Mimi is working um, in, in, in abroad right now and, and uh, very busy and very thank you for your time. And of course, Attorney Joseph, um, uh, we hope you feel better. Um, and thank you again for sharing your insights. I hope this has been a valuable discussion for you um, as it has been for all of us listening to you. Uh, thank you again so, so much. Um, before we, I invite our executive director for the closing remarks, we request everyone um, to help us improve um, and please help us um, by sharing your feedback about the event. Um, this is our QR code on the screen. Let us know how we can, um, you know, uh, topics that you'd like to um, uh, us to, to present to you um, or, and also how we ran into our program for our um, improvement. Thank you again so much. Um, so thank you for our closing remarks. Um, may I call on our executive director, <coughs> Makati Business Club, Mr. Coco Alquas. Uh, Coco, to you. So, of course, when you call me for the closing remarks, I screw up and I close the script. So, oh, no. and, uh, <laughs> uh, rather than try to find that, let me just uh, wing this a little. So, first, thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for being here, especially to Robert, to Mimi, to Joseph, to Bonar, of course, um, and everyone else who attended today. Uh, I've been listening the whole time. A lot of this is technical and new, especially to me. I guess you guys are have been have uh, have been uh, watching it and 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 uh, and studying it already. A lot of it is new and technical uh, to all of us, but especially to to people like me, it's been very interesting to to learn that. Um, yesterday, this is this is a very important um, subject for us. And when when Rox and her team first brought it to me, uh, I, I I was asking them, so what makes this important? And what what really, uh, uh, what really um, uh, grabbed me was when we talk about uh, environment uh, in this country and talk about reducing the carbon footprint, uh, it, it's often a case of, wait a minute, the bigger countries in this world have caused most of the carbon footprint and why are, why are we uh, being asked to do the same thing that, that they're doing? I know that's a whole different debate, but what struck me was the fact that we are unfortunately a leader when it comes to the, the plastic part of that. And, and Mimi and others have, have, uh, have referred to the sachet economy and how that, that factors in there. And so this is an area where I guess we don't only have the responsibility to, uh, to take action, but we can be a leader in that and maybe even show other countries how to do it. Uh, and, and, and who knows, even make money out of that later on because we're the leaders and others will come to us for, for that advice or that service. And that's really the reason why we organize these things, not just for, for, for uh, players like you to, to learn from it, but also maybe to, to form collaborations and partnerships that can help the whole country as a whole and maybe uh, come up with, with uh, ventures that, that can help other countries as well or companies in other countries or even your branches or your head or your uh, your headquarters in, in other countries. That's the reason why why we do why why we decided to pursue this. Um, we're very glad, a special mention to to the Dutch Embassy for this partnership. 
Um, as uh, Robert mentioned yesterday, we had the, the pleasure of going over to the embassy. I think we have a photo of that um, uh, Ken and Rox uh, going over to the embassy to, to sign the, the, this partnership. Very, very pleased to meet um, Ambassador Marielle and of course Robert was there uh, joining us. We're, um, we're representatives from Alaska and, uh, and 7-Eleven. Tarang is uh, the head of Alaska in the Philippines. That's of course a, a unit of, uh, of, um, of, a, of a huge Dutch uh, milk uh, conglomerate. And uh, Victor is a member of our, of our board, also the head of 7-Eleven. And they had a very good discussion. I, I, my, I myself, I don't know about Ross and the team, was very enthralled by the discussion when you're talking about the practicalities of, uh, of this problem. And I learned a lot yesterday, just as I learned today. So um, we look forward to, to more of these discussions. Thank you again for everyone's participation. Very happy to see so many uh, players uh, participating in this. And we look forward to working with you and helping with you and learning with you uh, in the days ahead. Um, uh, with that, thank you very much. And please have a good day. I'll turn it back to Ross now. Thank you, Coco. Um, we've good, uh, we've uh, closed our our Facebook Live now. And uh, before we end this, we'd like to invite everyone, if you are willing to open your um, cameras, uh, we're going to take a group photo. All right. Um, if you're game to do so, <laughs> we'd love to see your faces and meet you. All right. Thank you. OK. Um, uh, OK. I'm gonna count um, for the, there are two pages. So I'm gonna count um, one, two, three, we'll go first page first. All right, smile, one, two, three, smile. All right, and for a second page, one, two, three, smile. All right, thank you everyone um, for attending our virtual uh, forum today. We have a next one on December 5th and um, that time we will be uh, providing you more information. We'll send you, um, uh, an email after this forum. Um, that topic would be on circular business models. Just give you more ideas um, uh, on what other companies are already doing to serve as an inspiration. We'll have some Dutch companies as well joining us. Um, and that will be on December 5th. And more information will be sent to your email addresses. So thank you again so much. Um, we I do hope you have a, a pleasant um, a Tuesday and uh, I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Roxanne. Thanks, Bye. Thanks, Coco. Bye. 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 Thanks, you all for joining. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Roxanne, pasabi kay ano ha? Ed Suwan, absuelto na ako. Ako oh, nga po eh. <laughs> yes, Monar. <laughs> I'll tell it. <laughs> uh, never say when no, Ed Suwan. When are you coming back? On the 14th. Maybe you can have lunch with Coco. Oh yeah, also, and uh, maybe share. talk about the things we talk we talked about. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Bye. Bye.